Hello, today is August 6, 2015. We're meeting today with Ronald Corey at his home in Arvada, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Ron, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your right, date of birth, so. where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay. I'm Ronald J. Corey, born August the 6th, 1917, at 12.05 a.m. on the North Shore, Indian town on the North Shore of Lake Michigan. My mother was a full-blooded English. My father was half Scotch and half Ojibwa Indian. Did you have any brothers and sisters? I had. I was a uh, the second, I had two sisters. Evelyn was the oldest one and Eileen was younger than me. So you were in the middle? Yes. Okay. And my first friend that I had as a little kid, about two years old, she was a little Indian girl, two years old, lived in our, right close to us, and she was my friend for almost six years and I put this story together I remembered that and then we my dad got a different job working for the railroad taking care of the coal trains and we had to move six miles north I never seen the girl anymore and what come back to me in the last few years that her she married and her and her husband moved to the west coast and they moved back when, when he retired and they only lived two years and I went down just to say hello to her about two years later and and I asked her said would you like to go out to lunch with me and she said, Ron, I'd love to. And that's the same girl I was a little girl with wow. when I was only two years old. <laughs> wow. Uh, that's yeah. a great story. It was a great life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, i got to start out by uh, wishing you a happy birthday. Today's your 98th birthday. Yeah, today's my 98th birthday, and, and everything is going good. Just I'm getting old like everybody else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. keeping up with the times. Yeah. Uh, it's been a great life. I've done a lot of different things, a lot of different jobs. Well, let's go back. Let's go back to your youth. Talk a little bit about growing up uh, in in Michigan. And oh. uh, you went through the school system and played sports. And talk a little bit about growing up. And Oh, I went to uh, the little school where I went to when we moved. Uh, only had eight grades. And 15 children was the most I ever had in school. <laughs> and uh, I had different teachers over the years. And then uh, my one teacher that finally got me going was my sister. She was the teacher, my older sister. Oh, wow. She was a half-sister, you know, born by my mother's first husband. And... She was half Indian there, but she taught me real good. She's very strict, that, and helped me get going in, in my life. Uh, oh, there was several things like that. I ended up in uh, sports and that, and topped out in the sports, done real good. Ended up as a pitcher for the Baseball, a couple of baseball teams, won the games for them twice, <laughs> shot the other people right out. <laughs> <laughs> but that was as far as that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, oh, there was a lot of things in the younger life like that. And I was raised right there in the town. And from the time I was about seven years old, us kids always had our own jobs to do. And I had to 
bring in wood for the fire at night, you know. Mm. And then uh, as I grew up a little bit older, I had to go out and uh, feed the cows some hay and then go and water them after we'd have breakfast. Uh, and today it sounds like a hard life, but it was easy. Yeah. It was our way of life. Yeah, yeah. And we had uh, three milk cows, about 40, 50 chickens, and all kinds of stuff. We supported ourselves even during the Depression. That's why I always like to ask your, your uh, generation, was your family um, much affected by the Great Depression? Pardon? Was your family affected by the Depression? No, we, we supported ourselves. Okay. We never did with that. Uh, my mother, my dad built, uh, in addition to our home, it was an old hotel from the lumberjacks there. And my mother made a, made a little store out of that addition, and she sold groceries and different things that people had made, you know. And we had the cows and the chickens. We were never hungry. Okay. No. Oh, good. Now, good. we worked hard, but we were fed good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I loved potatoes, and I still do. Yeah? Yeah. Uh. Yeah. So you went through the school system and graduated from high school. What did you do when you got out of high school? Uh, before I got out of high school, my father passed away when I was only 18. Oh. And... Uh, before that, I'd been working for, uh, in the summer times, I'd been working for some uh, masons. Uh, a father and three sons, they were all German masons. And I worked for them, uh, just learning to mix, mix up cement and stuff. And as time went by, over a few years, they taught me how to lay stone, and how to lay brick, and I learned that trade, and I got to where I could build a half of a outside outside fireplace. So a lot of things like that went on in life. And when my dad passed away, and then I had to go on something steady there. So they got me into the you I don't know if you heard that the CCC camp. Yes, yes, uh huh. And I served almost a year in there, there. And that was great. That was good training for the young guys to stay away from home and it was actually getting us ready for World War II. Yeah, yeah. Where, where did you go? Where was your CCC camp at? In the, right near St. Ignace, Michigan. Okay, so you on stayed... On the North Shore. Okay. Uh, North Shore of Lake Michigan. And what kind of projects did you work on uh, at the camp? Oh, well, that's where I learned to operate a crawler tractor. And we done what they call TSI, timber stand improvement. And uh, different things like that, and to learn the trade. And then after I learned the trade of uh, crawling the tractor, they asked me to work in the garage with them. And I had done a lot of that when I was a kid on our own pickup trucks. and. Uh, Charlie Hawks was a my boss and the mechanics and uh, I got pretty good at it. One day he said to me, Ron, I want you to bring that Chevy truck in and put it on the hoist and raise it up. So I did. I brought it in, put it on the hoist and raised it up. He said, okay, that's all yours. You're going, to earn, you're going to overhaul that engine. Wow. I said, Charlie, I don't, I can remember this. Charlie, I don't think I can do that good. He said, yes, you're kidding. I know you're kidding. So we took it all apart, and I rebuilt the whole engine, rehoned all the cylinder walls, wow. put it back together, and it ran good. And he said, now you see, I told you. And you can do that same with that pickup truck you got that's burning oil. I said, they won't let me do that here in camp. No, you can bring it down to my place. He lived off of the camp. You bring it down to my place and you can use my tools. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and I was only 18. Wow. <laughs> wow. And then after after that, then I, I wanted, my mother wanted me to come back home to stay because that was an income for her and for me. Right. But uh, she needed me at home with the cows and things like that with my dad gone, you know. Yeah. So I'd done that, moved back home, and then he got me on with the WPA, Workman's Progress Administration. Mm -hmm. And that was only $17.50 a week. Wow. Yeah. And you had to go to work. I can remember working in the winter on it. <clears throat> my brother-in-law, he was half Indian, the same as my dad. And he married my older sister. And he came over early in the morning at one time and he said, Ron, are you ready to go? I said, yeah, take a look out the front window, Frank. I want to see what to wear, you know. And he looked out the front window at the thermometer, and he said, it's 30 below zero. Oh. I think, I said, do you think we can go? Oh, we got to go, Ron. He said, they were the old fires. We had to go to work. Wow. And we stayed there all day, and they couldn't even, they couldn't even get the tractor started. Oh. Uh, but that was the way of life. Yeah. You couldn't quit. Yeah. You know? Right. And it worked out real good. And then from that, uh, from that then, after the war, I... Well, let's, no, con no. let's continue your story and we'll, in order. So uh, you worked for the WPA, and then from the WPA, is that when you went into the service? No, huh. no. Uh, I, uh, I finally got a job driving truck for the new highway, US 2. And I uh, drove truck for there from till I was uh, 21 years old. And when he finished the job, the superintendent says to us three guys, if you want to come with me, I got another job down in Lower Michigan. And that's when I left home, went down there. And then I met another, I met a girl down there. I went to aircraft school, finished the whole course. And I didn't like the job that they helped me get, working in the factory for Packard Motors. And the day I quit, I got home and there was no work much, you know. And uh, I, my mail came in, and here was a notice from the city of Detroit to report for training for bus driving bus for the city. And that's what I'd done for 19 years. Wow. 19 years. And after I got hurt, after that, I went on to sell in real estate. Well, let's let's back up though, uh, Ron. To uh, okay, uh, you getting into the, uh, this was after the service, correct? Pardon. This was after you were in the service, right? You drove uh, your bus. This oh yeah. Okay, yeah. So let's go. Let's back up and 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 talk about you going into the service. Oh, before I went into the service, no, I got. I got that job before I went in the service for, oh. city, for the city. Oh, okay. But then I got drafted. Oh, okay. So it was disrupted. Seven months. Okay. Then yeah. I got drafted. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, I left. You want me to say about the service then? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me let me ask you. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, do I remember where I? Do you remember hearing about Pearl Harbor and where you were that day? Oh. I was working for the city of Detroit at that time. Yeah, we got shook up pretty bad about it. And I wanted to go after the Japanese, you know. Yeah. But I was waiting until they called me because I was registered there. So they, they did call me. I got married on the 11th day of April, and I got drafted on the 16th day. Oh, well, so, of, <laughs> of, of uh, 42? Pardon? 1942? What you? What year were you drafted? 1942? 19, I was drafted 1942. Okay. 
1942. Five days after you got married, huh? Yeah, right. Oh. And I stayed in until November the 9th, 1945. Oh, boy. Uh, uh, how much longer after you got your draft notice before you left to go to uh, basic training? Oh, was it? Uh, I went. I went straight from from there after I got drafted, straight to Marquette, Michigan, and we. The. Uh, so so right away you you went out. We were introduced to the army right there, in Marquette, Michigan. And. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my aunt didn't want me to go to their dinner. She said, I want you to come to our dinner. My aunt lived in Marquette. So this is what we done. I found out what the train, time the train was leaving. And we got down to the train going to Fort Sheridan, Illinois. There. And we walked up to the officers and said, this is the train to going to Fort Sheridan. And he said, Yes, it is. I said, well, I'm Ronald Corey. I was supposed to be on that. He, he said, well, where you been? We've been looking for you. And the colonel said, oh, quieting down. He said, come on, Ron, get on the back of the, the veranda on the train, the half coach train. He says, raise your hand. I raised my hand and swore me in around the back of the train. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and we headed for Fort Sheridan that night. Uh, Got in there the next morning. They're all tired out. Yeah. And been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's celebrating. We're going after the Japs. Yeah. Uh, Didn't turn out that way. Yeah, right, right. No. Well, how, how was basic training for you? How was that? That transition going from civilian life into military life was it was it tough on you? Um, I went in. I was supposed to go into uh, uh, Aberdeen, Maryland, uh, for the to train people for the uh, tanks and stuff to train people. Because I had learned to operate tractor. Oh, right. Okay. Tractor, you know? That makes sense. And that was why. But I finagled a three-day weekend to go home first. And they did. They gave it to me. And when I come back, I thought, I went and told them, I said, I'm, I'm all ready to, to go. And they looked on the board. He said, look on the board. And looked on the board. It was all gone. I had to go to... Um, Alexandria, Louisiana, and, uh, and train there. And it was the infantry. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, they, we went into basic training, and then uh, they had a meeting one morning, and they said, we're having a, a new company forming. And if anybody wants to volunteer, let me know. I said the first sergeant, and he was a World War uh, World War One veteran. I said the first sergeant, is there any? You think there's any ratings? Not any any good in there? He said they're probably only about six privates in the company. I said, could you put me down? That's how I ended up in the 363rd Engineers. Hmm. <laughs> and I stayed in uh, training for that, in the engineers. And then we got our notice to ship out. Uh, it was almost a year later. Well, it was the next March. There. Now, now did, did your wife come down to Louisiana with you, or did she stay up in Michigan? No, I stayed, no, I, st no, I, I stayed in Louisiana, she stayed in Michigan. Okay. Yeah. yeah. How, how was it being in, in Louisiana, because that's entirely different than Michigan, was it? Uh, oh, yeah, it's really, really humid. Yeah. But I adopted, adopted to it. But the bad part was, where did I go from there? The dry country. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and uh, 
Well, I got used to it, and I know it was there. I had to do it. Yeah, yeah. And what what kind of things did you did you learn? Did you, did you train to do in the engineers? Well, what they done? They asked for volunteers to work in the kitchen. Of course, I'd worked in the kitchen at home a lot. You know, when I was a kid, my mother taught me about cooking and that. So they asked for volunteers. So I volunteered. I went in there and I went in as a second cook. Before, end up, and before I got out of there, uh, they wanted to open officer's mess. So the major come, and he looked for somebody to open officer's mess. And uh, Smitty, my mess sergeant, said to me, Ron, why don't you? I said, uh, the major said, I don't think I can cook that good. He said, well, you can, you can learn too. He said, okay. He said, I'll give you another stripe. <laughs> that's where I got my third stripes. <laughs> and I stayed at that. And then to so we went overseas. And I stayed at overseas until all for about uh, three months or more. And then I, <clears throat> I asked, went and asked the captain to be traded. I'd like to go to Ave Pass in the mountains and work on what I was trained to do, heavy equipment there. He said, okay, I'm gone the next day. <laughs> and in the meantime, and during that three months, I was over there, I was only there about two months. I got a letter from my wife and says, I'm going to get a divorce. Oh boy. I was only married six days. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I got mad about that. And I was wrong, but nobody to guide me to yeah. say what to do. And I said to this friend of mine, Solomon, I said, if she can do that, so can I. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to town. I'm go We're still in Turan. I'm going to town and see if I can meet a nice girl. So most of the people were Iranians or uh, Turks or Greeks or people from all over the world in Tehran. Yeah. Our best our best furnace van right now is from Tehran. It lives here. Yeah. Yeah. And when they're in town we was walking down the street, and here come these two two girls. Two young girls. They weren't Iranians. They weren't. And uh, I stopped to look in the window like this window, and the two girls was coming. And I said something in Russian to them. We had the books to go by. And I said, uh, would you like to I buy a, a babushka? A babushka. And she said, she started to laugh, her and the other girl. I said, what's the matter? Well, she told me in English in the book, she said, that means grandmother in Russian. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how we met. And I, I got involved with her, and I got caught saying overnight, this I'm telling you, and I got penalized to the camp for a week, and when the when the week was over, first sergeant come and told me, and I got mad about it, and I said, "You can t tell the captain to do what he wants with it." There, never talk like that to anybody, you know. And I was so fed up, I didn't know what was going on. Sure. There. And. Uh, <clears throat> I got caught spending the night in town with the girls. Yeah. Eh? Beautiful, most beautiful girl I ever seen. Real light complected and light blue eyes and, and natural blonde hair. She was only 17, the other girl was only 15. I've never seen the other girl no more. And so we got together, her and I. Uh, and then the captain called me and said, 
wanted to know what was the matter, what's going on. I said, I'd like to be traded. I'd like to be traded. I want to go to the mountains and work on the highway. That's what I came here for. He said, okay. I was gone the next day. Huh. And I never thought about the girl. I was so disgusted there. And she didn't take anything to pro to protect herself. They didn't know that. Yeah. And neither. I didn't know too much about it. So, uh, <clears throat> it was about 11 months later when we came back, I was coming back to the States. I went into town. I went to this restaurant with this Polish girl. We had a Polish uh, refugee camp there. And I seen Wanda and I said, have you seen Zina around? She was a Russian girl. She said, no, Ron. Zina and her mother and the baby has gone on, the, gone on with the Russian truck and they're gone back to Russia. And she said, no, I'm glad you didn't marry her. She said, she's Russian. She'd leave you over there. <laughs> so I'm telling you that. Yeah, yeah. I never knew for sure. But I had one lady who was from in the mountains here that I met on the airplane. She was from over there. And she wanted to go look her up. But in the meantime, we were still married because she didn't get the divorce. Ah, uh huh. It was really a mix up, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing I could do about it, you know. It's too late. I would like to have done it over, but you can't do it over. Right, right. There. Yeah. It was a bad mistake. Yeah. But Zena was a, really a sweetheart. Uh -huh. Really a sweetheart, you know. That Wanda might have been right. She said the, the Russians mistreated us so bad, and they uh, came through. She was from Vilno, Poland. There. Ah, right. And she said the, uh, raped the girls and the women, mm. cut mm. all her hair off and all that kind of stuff, you know. And she hated the Russians. Mm. There. Well, but let's... uh. Then when I came back to Saran and they told me that then. Had getting off the truck, we were on our way back to Tehran to for our reembarkation, and uh, the the driver wouldn't stop when we were pounding on the cab. You know, we we're in the back, some of us, and it went a long ways. And it was kind of washboard road there, and. <clears throat> When he did stop, when we got off, when I hit the ground, I hit the ground stiff-legged. Tore my prostate loose. Oh! Wow. And I ended up in the hospital. So where did they put me? They put me in the board with the, the guys that had venereal disease, uh -huh. PD. He kept me six days. I said, I haven't been no girls around up there where I'm at in the mountains. That doesn't mean nothing. But the bad part of it is, I should have been getting pension from this. See? And the uh, bad part of that was, then, that when they said we got to release you, when you go home, you'll have to drink a lot of milk and eat a lot of eggs to let heals up. I just found out five years ago here at the Veterans Hospital that what happened was that my prostate has turned over on its side. And I've had trouble all my life. Oh, wow. I'm on medication you know, all oh, the time for uh, it. There. Wow. Yeah. And... Uh, the other than have, I tried to get pension here from the VA here. But the guy finally said to me, I was offered it twice before and turned down when I could work. But now that I'm retired, I wanted to get it. I said, oh, he said, we got these guys coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq now. We got to place them in. And he let it go, but... When they sent me to the hospital for examination, 
they done all this there from my hearing and my rest of my system. Uh, about two weeks later, I got a letter from them that I should see Dr. So-and-so. <clears throat> That's the first time that I knew the prostate was turned over. Hmm. All and those I years. I could have been pension all those years. Yeah. So they give me a pension for the hearing, for my hearing. Hmm. So I get fifteen fifty a month for that. So I said, just leave it alone. Wow. Uh, leave it alone. Forget yeah. about it. Just go ahead with the pills. Yeah. And if the city of Detroit knew that, they'd want their money back from Uncle Sam. Because they're the one paying that paid for the medication all these years. Uh, wow. Well, Ron, let's let's back up again uh, to your to your time. You got out of uh, training in Louisiana, and then went and then from there went to Iran. Uh, from training in uh, Louisiana, we went from there to. Uh, that was a long trip. <laughs> yeah, talk about that trip. I yeah. mean, that, that had to be an adventure. When we left from there in. March, I think it was, 80, 82, no, 83. 43? 83. And we went to Long Beach, California, and got on the ship, big ship, the Hermitage, got uh, 5,000 or 8,000 GIs, Ooh. something wow. like that. It was all converted into a troop ship. Yeah. There. And we had a, we went out and, and we had escort. We headed south to South America. And, and, and how, how was that? Here's a, here's a boy from Michigan going to sea. Did you get your sea legs? How was the trip for you? Pardon? How was the trip for you? Did you get your sea legs? Or was it uh, were you, on the, when you got on the ocean, did you get your sea legs or did you get seasick? Oh, no. No, I didn't get seasick. Okay. No, I was used to that when I was a kid. My dad was a commercial fisherman. Oh, okay. For quite a while before he got that railroad job. And I'd been on bad storms with him. Okay. There. So you headed to South America, you said? The so then we went south, crossed the equator, and went on to Wellington, New Zealand. Wow. And then it was five days or six there. And then from there out and around to Melbourne, Australia, wow. and another five or six days. And then from there we stayed south. Because of the Japanese, uh -huh. and I thought that's where we're going. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, we're going south, farther around, and I think that a submarine spotted us this one time at night. That this big ship we were on had two big turbines, they run on one, and they cranked up the other one, and that ship just shook all over. But we could outrun the submarine. They were fast enough with two motors, and we did. Wow. And we ended up in Bombay, India. Wow. And from Bombay, we transferred onto a, a, a five British freighters, I think it was, and they took us up to the Indian Ocean, up into the Persian Gulf, and up into uh, Karamshah, Iran. And that's where we unloaded Crown Show I ran. What an adventure. Pardon? What an adventure that was, that trip. Quite quite an adventure, that trip. Y your whole trip was quite an adventure. I don't I, I don't understand. The whole time that the, the trip you took was oh, quite, quite an adventure. Quite an adventure. Fifty three days. Wow. <laughs> to go over to get over there. And we were there in Karamshaw about six days. And it was kind of scary living in these British tents. And these, these uh, nut coyotes, they're something like uh, about big as a fox. They had a lot of them. And you'd hear them in the middle of the night. <laughs> it sounded like they're covering it in the tent. <laughs> about six days, and then they shipped out and went, to, went up to... Uh, Iran. That was it. And from there, they shipped us from different places, you know. I cooked there at Tehran there for a while. 
until I told you about that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Then, then you went up to the mountains. Went to the mountains. Yeah. What What was it like? Did you have time to to go out and walk around Tehran and explore and meet people? Uh no, you couldn't. In Tehran, shall you mean? Oh, wait, no, when you were in Tehran, were, were you able to get out and, and explore? Oh, in Tehran, oh yeah, you could go downtown. Yeah, they had uh, trucks would take you down. They go down, the uh, first one is 10 o'clock in the morning, and the last one is 10 o'clock at night, back and forth. Mm -hmm. that, there, and if you miss that, you're in trouble. <laughs> That's well, what happened to me. <laughs> it, it must have been... Uh, a, a different world from from yeah. from Michigan. I mean, uh, oh yeah, but there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of different people there. The the Greeks had a, a lot of business there. They had one one big restaurant and bar. It was a Greek belonged to the Greeks. The better restaurant was where that uh, Polish girl worked in. That was a nice restaurant there, but the one with the bar and uh, and the uh, lunches and that, uh, that was kind of a pickup for a lot of prostitutes, you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't go along with that. Yeah, you know? yeah. I was walking down the street to go to this. I had this good friend of mine, Ames. He was Indian from Oklahoma, and a nice guy. No, a really nice guy, quiet, real quiet. We were going back to go to catch our truck to go back to camp at night. We were walking down the street, and he seen these two men coming, all dressed up, nice suits. And they said something about the Americans, and I didn't hear it. He did. And zip! He pulled out that knife and stuck that guy right there. Wow. Oh, yeah. I said, come on, come on, you can get away. No, 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 they can't talk like that. Uh. No, he ended up, the MPs pulled, took him in. What well, was bad, the MPs beat the hell out of him at, at the police station, mm. too. That wasn't good. And I never seen names no more. Mm. Probably wasn't long after that when I left. They went up to the mountains? To the mountains, yeah. Okay. And that was nice in the mountains. Yeah, talk talk about your time there. Oh, yeah. I worked, I drove uh, these big trucks. We had 20-ton trucks that had belonged to an American contractor who had still there. And he trained me on that big truck, on that big truck to haul, haul and dirt for on the roads, winding out the roads, you know, and repairs. I ended up doing that, and then from that, went on to Bulldozer, there. That was a long, a really long story. We had this one guy, the tech sergeant, he couldn't even off the road, he even couldn't even operate the road grader. So, <laughs> in the winter time, when we're having all that snow in the high country, uh, we had the road, we had got the road on blocks, but we had the bank so high from plowing, you know. So I brought him up there to bring the D8, the big D8 dozer to push it off. What's he try to do? He tries to go up and take a little bit off the top. So we know what happened. He gets up in the middle, now when the dozer goes, and he's all hung up. So here it comes, here I come along with the, with the big plow, and here comes the other guy with, with the other truck. There, and Ben said, I'd like you guys to hook onto him, because if he goes any farther, he's going over into that canyon. Mm. So we hooked onto him and we pulled him off. When they got off, and got the tractor on down on the footing. Ben said to me, "How would you have done that when you?" I said, "You can't go over the top. You got to take a little piece off and shove it off." And Ben says, "I know." 
He said, don't you think it's time for him to go back to school? And here's the, he said, tech sergeant, I'm a three stripe. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? That was the way he was there. Nice guy, but he couldn't do the work, but he sure buffaloed his way in yeah. there. So Ben said, I want you to hook onto him. So we hooked onto him in the other truck. When he went to pull it off, this other separate lines there, he said, I'll give you the word. So when he said, go ahead, the old Walters was a four wheel positive drive that didn't run no axle, drove off the drums. Big trucks, powerful. We had him in northern Michigan for plowing before I went over. And that's the reason I knew about them. So he couldn't open the road. And, and I had gone to the officer. Lieutenant, I think it was, or captain. And I said, why don't we do it like it done back in Michigan? He said, how's that? I said, we hooked the two trucks together. One push and the other one pull. You got signals to use, you know. I said, well, go on up to Boulder Pool and tell them. So I went up there and told them what to do. And before the day was over, they had it all hooked up. Huh. So here we go. Wow. Right on up the mountains. Uh, it was uh, the convoys couldn't get through. So that so your job there was to to maintain the highway, and that was the the convoys that delivered supplies to Russia. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. And after the war, Kara's got it. She kept that stuff for me. Then the Russians sent me a medal uh -huh. of appreciation and thank you for helping us win the war. Wow. Huh. <laughs> Uh, and I said, <laughs> anyway, old Ben said, uh, and that bulldozer pushing it, pulling them back, you know. He said, Ron, don't you think it's time that he go back to school? Uh -huh. <laughs> I said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. But so many things that I'd done in the service like that, never got no credit for it. Yeah, right. I wasn't uh, one of these. Uh, yeah. Go ask him. If you want to give it, give it. But the old captain that I told that time too to get out of Turan, you know, he didn't like that. But after uh, they shut, well, shutting down in Turan and sending send all these people to the mountains, he ended up at our camp. I was the first, that was the first fresh and neat he ever got since he left the U.S. And I was, I got the guys to how to hunt gazelle at nighttime. Uh -huh. I made a big light to hunt gazelle. And had to, that's what you had to do, hunt them at nighttime. And I, then I found out about the wild boar. Killed the three wild boar accidentally. We were hunting gazelle. In the evening we seen a that different camp. Uh -huh. We were hunting gazelle, but we didn't go there. We went hunting for a mountain lion they said was hanging out behind their camp, just over the hill. So it was starting to get dusk, and I said to Sully, I think we better go. I said, hey, look at over there, going up the side of that hill. There's three things going up. I'll bet they're pigs. So we went down, and we came, took the trail down below, and I said this. I think there's three of them. I think they're better than down. I said, I'll take the farthest one. You get the first one, and the one in the middle will go together. We shouldn't have been doing that. We're on foot. And when they spotted us, they jumped. I got the first one, hit him right in the back of the head with that 30 caliber. And uh, he got the, the first one. The second one, I wounded. We got off and running. It run down, way down below. And we had an awful time finishing him off. He tried to get to us, but I had broke his back. Wow. There, he drug himself. But they're vicious, you know. Yeah. We didn't know anything about them. 
found out later he should name me on foot with them. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. And when the captain came to our camp, that was the first meet he got. And <laughs> he thought, this, I guess this guy's okay. And after the war, he found my address and he sent me a letter to come and join the, their officers club. Oh, really? Where he was at. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Yeah. So you would, that's how you got, uh, would provide meat to the camp? You'd go out and hunt? What else would you eat? Would it be just K rations or what other food would you have? Pardon? What other food would you have at the camp besides what you hunted for? Did they bring in rations or what well, would you... our camps, uh, our camps up in the mountains, or we stayed there and until we were closing down on the yeah. war, war ended with Germany. Yeah. There, but it wasn't over with the Japan. Right, right. Well, there. describe what the camp was like. What were your living conditions like? Pardon? What were your living conditions like at the camp? Oh, we had good camp. Oh, we did you? Had, yeah? Oh, yeah, we had barracks. All built oh, barracks. Oh, okay. Yeah, they were good, and they were, they were warm, they were warm. My old master sergeant, <laughs> he was kind of alcoholic, but a wonderful carpenter too. Yeah, that's what he was hired for. He was older, one of the older guys. Yeah. We had one guy, at, he was a demolition expert, and he lost his eye. Yeah, he lost his eye in a misfortune. Mm. That was at Turan Camp when we was building that. Mm. Uh, one of the one of the little bombs went off. And that and put his eye out. Mm. So they sent him home. Bob Sheridan, really a nice guy. Mm. But he was old. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so you said you hunted for food. Is that is that where you got mostly your meat, or did what kind of food did did they have rations, or what did you eat for food? Oh yeah, we had uh, most of our food out before that was uh, canned food. You know, uh -huh. big cans, big ration food. Same at Turan. We even took up a collection sometimes to buy an eggs from the from the locals from the locals. Uh -huh. And then uh, somebody put up a fuss about that. They didn't want to volunteer, and they didn't want to get into it. So we had to quit doing that. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. So if we wanted any eggs, we'd have to bring them in and take them in the kitchen after working hours and do what we want to have eggs in if you wanted. Yeah. Hmm. What, what, what would, Ron, what would you do for entertainment when you weren't on duty? Uh, there wasn't anything, no. What would you do to pass they, the time? They played cards, some of them played cards, and then down at the railroad camp, there, there were some good card players there, and we had some at ours camp. Why well, this one guy, a Durso Italian, there, he was good. He's, he made so much money doing that on payday that they... They changed the rules. You couldn't send too much money home. <laughs> he had so much money, he couldn't send it all home. Uh. <laughs> but, uh, you could go to the bank in, our, in Tehran if you wanted to. Yeah. You could change the money back and forth. And the Imperial Bank of Iran, that was British, actually a British bank. And the British and the Germans are the ones that helped the Iranians most. Oh, yeah. They, and uh, the Iranian trucks, army trucks, all big German diesels. Really? Huh? Yeah, and here yeah. we're driving those, <laughs> those little Chevrolets, GMCs, and stuff like that. But, well, like one of the Germans guys told me that was a a combat veteran in World War II. He came to this over here. And we became good friends. And then he said, uh, I said to him, there are really some nice equipment you guys got in them trucks. And he said, yeah, 
We could shoot one. <clears throat> We can shoot it on one of your trucks and there's another 10 more is coming off the assembly line. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't keep up with them. Yeah, yeah. There. Uh. So, <clears throat> anyway, and, uh, uh, I transferred when we left Tehran for embarkation. We went to Abidjan, Iran. They took us by train and we was there for about two weeks. And it was so hot. The temperatures were so much hotter. Oh. And the mountains are nice. Yeah. There. And uh, we used to get up uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning. And they'd have something to eat around 4. And the way we'd go to work. We'd work until about 11 or 12. And my job was with the uh, earth mover, cat and earth mover, or scraper, you call them, is picking up that broken up stuff where the planes have been coming down, breaking it up, you know. We take that up and stockpile it at the end. Then they use that over. They mix it with a new solution they had. And one day I was uh, going up over the top and unloading, my, unloading that load. And a plane was coming down from India, Karachi. Wow. He's trying to land in Abadan. And he just skipped the top of my <laughs> my tractor. Wow. And old Ben jumped in the Jeep and he ran down to the, down there. And I guess he really raised hell. <laughs> uh. But what happened was, it wasn't the pilots were better, but the, the plane was going to hell. It was backfiring, backfiring. When my turn come to leave there, we ended up on that damn plane. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And when we went to go out to get on the plane at night, there, and the plane would backfire and backfire. And finally, they thought they got it going. And we got going down that runway just about to take off, and then boom, it went. And they shut it down, and back to the other end we go to warm up some more. And you thought I'm a cold sweat? I had it. Oh, <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> I had a cold sweat to warm up some more, but they warmed it up. By God, we got going. Hmm. They got it going, but we had to come back anyway. We got half and then halfway to Havana, Arabia, where we we're supposed to land for fuel. And they, and they come back and said, we got to go back. There's a dust storm going on in Havana. We can't land. So we had to go back. And when we did go to leave, got another on plane and took us all the way to Casablanca. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Casablanca, North Africa. And we stopped in Tel Aviv. Two different places, Cairo and Tel Aviv. We stopped in two places there. And we got a chance to go through the Basda. The Basda, which is a shopping center in the, in the town. I, th I think that was in Cairo. There are no paved streets, you know, just dirt streets. Wow. Yeah. They had a chance to see that. And when we got in Casablanca, they said we're going to be there for probably four or five days before we get a plane out. And didn't even get my bed made yet in the tent. We had the tents for us there. And my partner said, Ron, aren't you getting ready? What do you mean? He said, we're going. They're calling us. So when we go and they take us to a room for briefing, what do you think we ended up on? A beautiful DC-6 plane, Pan American, and it flew us to the Azores, we landed in the Azores in the middle of the night, and from there we refueled and went on to uh, Bermuda. Wow. And then from Bermuda to Miami. Wow. Uh, what a change that was to go from Iran to uh, 
Miami. Back to civilization, really. Supposed to have uh, 15 days at Miami. And after uh, about six, seven days, I went and asked the colonel, I said, could I transfer? I said, I can't stand this after coming out of a dry country. It was so bad. And they told us, don't hang your clothes tight in the closet. You got to keep them open. We were on the beach, President Madison. Yeah. And he said, well, you have two choices. You got to go over the Japanese theater or go under Chanute Field and cook in the kitchen of Chanute Field. I said, I'll take Chanute Field. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I went to Chinook Field and I cooked in there. I had a good job working there. I'd done the meat program. Get up three o'clock in the morning, lived in Alexandria in town, and the wife came down there to live and she got a job working quartermaster. And I go in there, get up at three o'clock and go in there and start, at, I think about four, something like that, three thirty or four. And go in the big locker room and all kinds of meat hanging, beef hanging. You got to get this all ready for the for the ovens, roast beef. And we had that a lot. You know. And we fed uh, 25, I think. Was it 2,500 Americans? Wow. And we had about, I think. Uh, 300 German prisoners we fed. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and the, the Germans ain't last, but they ain't good. We always had good food. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't be surprised if half of them stayed there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I never forget that one story about the. This was in uh, Reader's Digest. Was that this one guy, uh, G.I., was captured in this year, a German soldier, and the soldier wasn't shooting back at him. And he came out. He wanted to give up. He was, and they talked about it, and he said, you don't want to go back in Germany, he said, to help the Germans, he said, Come with us, he said, we have beefsteak and that every day and we'll get along. He was lying. <laughs> he told him that. The guy said, okay, I'm, I'm give him the gun and he was all done. Took him in. But they did fix him some meat. <laughs> so he wouldn't, wouldn't be lying to him completely. Yeah. But uh, I cooked there at Chinook Field until I was discharged. And then the, the wife and I both went back to Michigan, went back to Detroit, got discharged on November the 9th. And on the 15th day of November, I was in the woods in Northern Michigan hunting deer. Is that right? Oh, <laughs> wow. Uh, uh. Well, that's where I was from. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. And the missed home, you know. Yeah, uh-huh. I sure. lived in Detroit. But they really never liked it, you know. Yeah. We never, there was no, no, no trouble with the black people and no, none. Everything went along good. Even when I was driving a bus, they only ever had one guy give me a problem. And it was at nighttime. He was going, uh, <clears throat> he got on the bus and he started to, Complaining, complaining. We had a lot of black people on the bus, but no trouble with them. This guy tried it. And when we got to the Woodward Avenue, it was the main drag in Detroit, I had stopped, I had stopped on the light. Wasn't supposed to let him out on the, that side. You're supposed to take him across the bus stop because of insurance and he's standing in the step well said I want to get out and he'd make him believe like he's got a gun I said don't worry I come prepared for guys like you all getting I open that door and I got food <laughs> on the street 
So the funny part was, he got on the other bus, he came through, and was working at the motor, at the bowling pool, two blocks from where I lived, out on the east side, right almost to the edge of Detroit. Now and then the next morning, I wanted to get to the hardware, I wanted to get some shells, and stuff. And this guy come in, the, he, was, he was a cleaner, cleaning at the pool, at the, and he came in there, and I turned around and, and I said to the, the, the owner, I knew him real well, and I said, have you got some good shotgun shells? And he said, yeah, what are you going to do with them? I said, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot me a so-and-so. <laughs> and this guy heard that, and he went flew out, the, out that door. I, never, I didn't have no shells. <laughs> I never seen him no more. Yeah. I don't know if he quit or what. <laughs> but he was just a troublemaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We never had, we weren't having no trouble yeah. with it. So now, did the city, they held your job while you were away? You got your job back when you got back from the service? Yeah, I, okay. went in, I worked seven months before I got drafted, and that covered me over my uh, six months. You had to be six months or you didn't get full. Okay. So that's the reason I got my pension, and then uh, I drove like that till, uh, till 18... Sixteen years later, and uh, had a good record, no trouble. And I was coming, taking a load down, took a load down to town, downtown. I was coming out of town. I only had I think thirteen people on the bus, going back home. That been downtown working all night. And come to this dead end stop. And you couldn't go no farther. It was building. It was the end of the street. Larned and Mount Elliot. And uh, I, I was real careful there because it was a policeman killed two weeks before that on a motorcycle right there. Or somebody run the light. So I come down, I'm about, how far? 60 foot, I think it was, ahead. And the light would have turned green. And I cruise up there and real slow. And it started coming around the corner, and I seen this truck coming. And I stopped to let him go around me. He never even seen me. He hit me broadside, oh. right there in the front, uh -oh. and knocked all hit so hard to knocked all the glass on the doors out on the right side. Yeah. And <clears throat> this guy was parked alongside of, waiting on the curb lane for the light to change when the truck went by him. i never forget his name, Robinson. He was an attorney. He said, I'll give you my card. He said, I was here when he went by me. I should have, I should have kept him hmm. as a witness, you know. I didn't think I needed it. I didn't know nothing about the laws then, yeah. about that. W were you injured? Pardon? Were you injured? Yeah, that's the reason my pension. Oh, okay. That was my first pension. Took a, a mower back. Mm. Yeah, hit me so hard. I got glass buried in my face yet. Mm. But I, I never found that out till here. When I took x-rays, they took x-rays for something. The doctor said, do you know you got glass and buried in your face? Do you know how? I said, well, I got hit with an accident. He said, what do you think? I said, I don't know, don't bother me. He said, leave it alone. And it's still there. Huh. No, it never bothered yeah. me. Wow. Huh. So I've been retired from the city of Detroit, but I uh, never should have settled for what we've done. No. Hmm. Settled for... Only 25. You got one guy, the one attorney trying to get me to settle for 18.5. And I said, no, I said, I don't think so. He said, what do you mean? This is a good offer. He started hollering at me. 
I jumped on the scene and I said, don't you holler at me, because I could fight, really. <laughs> I was raised in it. <laughs> and well, Mr. Atkins came out of the office, the old man, he said, um, you better get down here, you stay in the office. He said, it's all right with this, uh, this other man, attorneys. I said, yeah, I think I could get along. He seemed like a nice guy. They called me the next morning, said got a new offer. 25. Oh. I didn't know anything about it. Oh. Anything about the laws, you know. Here I had two kids growing up. Oh. Oh. Growing up and still married. And on, uh, so he got me to settle for that. He said, when we go to the bank now, we'll get the, and cash the check. And he said, when we got to the bank, he said, if you want to pay that 2500 back to the workman's comp that you've been drawing, he said, then after, if you, anything happens, you can't, then you have to go back on this. You can draw that for nine more, about nine years it is. I said, you better take it out. A year later, I went to look at my records. Didn't have no papers. Didn't get a receipt for it. So they took one third of the 25 million. Oh. And 25, that, uh, one third of the 25,000. And one third of that, one third of all of that, 2,500. And got me to settle for that. And I went to my, uh, my other insurance man, I insured my car and the house and that. And I asked Mr. Mr. Maylock, what do you think about that, about settlement? He said, Ron, there's no way you could settle that like that. You had two girls as teenagers, and you settled without them. And they knew they'd done wrong. Mm -hmm. Two years later, I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and he, he looked up, he found me out there. And I think he was trying to find out if I was coming back to sue him or something. But they didn't even call the city of Detroit. The city of Detroit should have been in it. Because the bus was all jammed. Right. It was a nice bus. Uh. So, that's where it went from there. And then, uh, I came out. The doctor back in Michigan told me after the war, I had so much trouble with sinus and that dry climate out there. He said, Ron, you got to get out of here. I can't keep doing this, operating on that sinus. You have to go to Colorado or someplace. So I did. I tried that. I came out here to Colorado Springs and went up in the mountains and back and forth. Because it got in my ear this year. It was popping. Popping. He said it'll break loose. Never broke loose, no. And that's what caused me to actually go deaf, pretty deaf. Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And when I got back to Detroit, I guess I get a card from these people that I stayed in the mountains with overnight. And they told me that, that they heard that uh, uh, Dr. Sullivan, who was a specialist in Colorado Springs, had a heart attack and died. Hmm. He was a young doctor. Yeah. So that was, a, that was all over with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I ended up going to Arizona. I went to Arizona for almost three years and bought a place down there. I lived at the, on that big canal, right on the edge of it, just at the edge of Turan, it was, of, uh, Phoenix? Not Turan. Phoenix? Uh, Tucson. Oh, Tucson, okay. Yeah. 
just at the edge of Tunisan. And until I met, I was up, I couldn't stand it in the summertime there. I'd go back to the upper peninsula because I was drier up there. I'd stay up there and and then uh, my friend <clears throat> was married to Ruth's sister that I went to school with. He went to school in Michigan with me. And they were living in Tucson and they were up the UP on vacation. And he called me. He said, Ron, why don't you come on down to visit us? We'll have supper at the, this restaurant. It was uh, a little over 100 miles from where I was at. And we have to leave here tonight to head back, catch the, catch the plane, I think it was. There. So I jumped in the car and went down. That's how I met Ruth. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I finally sold out the place in Tucson, and that's how I ended up here. November. End of November, 1982. Ever since. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yeah. let's talk a little bit. Talk a little bit about your family, your your kids and grandkids and. Oh, the girls, my girls, my oldest girl, uh, she liked to work, and she worked at the. Her husband was a manager at. Anderson Motorcycle in Pontiac, Michigan. And Ellen had the, trained to have the job there, took care of parts and stuff. And they stayed there, they worked there. And that was worked real good. And then they moved to another place in Westland. And that was off the same company, just another branch. And they were they worked both worked there for a while, and then he finally wanted her to quit. That's where things went bad. Then, and he started running. And that's why he wanted her to quit. And <clears throat> I made the mistake. Nineteen eighty-five. After I got hurt here again, I made a mistake of not staying there. When we went to leave, Ruth and I went to leave to come back, and she said, Dad, you can come and stay as long as you want. And she like, like almost crying, but she wasn't. And she died the next February 14th. Oh. Mm. It was him. He was the cause of it. Mm. And she wouldn't go to a doctor she got cold, got a cold, wouldn't go to the doctor, and and finally got pretty bad. And people across the street said they could you ought to go to their doctor down to Westland Clinic. And they, they took her down there. He examined her, and he said, "Here, take these pills." And you'll probably be all right tomorrow. She went home, took sick in the night, and she had called her mother and told her, that, told her mother she thought she was going to be okay. Her mother lived there, and said you don't have to come. And she died at, uh, I think, it was three o'clock in the morning. Mm. And here that doctor didn't even check her lungs. He gave her those pills. And so Phil, Phil sued him after that for 100000 That's all the insurance he had. Everything went bad from there on. Yeah. I should have stayed, but yeah. I didn't want to interfere. Sure. Because they had a boy. Yeah. And he loved his mother. And he was up for uh, uh, some special for high school, after high school, for going to college. Everything went bad. Mm -hmm. Everything went backwards after that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. And she passed away in in February. Yeah. I never forgot that. Yeah. So you've got two daughters. Yeah, I got the other daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, this I want to tell you. Uh, it'll probably be on the tape. And this is what a lot of people don't talk about. A lot of people don't even believe about. But it does with me because it's happened with me three times. Three different times in our family. And when we came back, Ruth and I came back after Ellen was buried. Uh, she wasn't buried. She wasn't really buried. What she had on her will when she went, she wanted to be, her ashes to be scattered over Orchard Lake near Pontiac, Michigan. Because that's where she loved, that's where I taught them to water ski with our boat and stuff and that. So Phil kept the ashes at home for two years before him and the son decided to do that. But everything went bad. Yeah. The sun went haywire. Mm. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and I come back and I was going upstairs crying at night. And Ruth and all them, they all knew about it. And <clears throat> I couldn't I couldn't take it. So what things happened, what I should have done, and I didn't do it because I didn't want to interfere, sure. interfere. Yeah, understandable. I turned the corner. I turned the corner to into the bedroom, and I was crying. And Alan just appeared to me like in a, in a, in a white cloud alongside of me. And she said, don't cry, Dad, I'm okay now. It was just like she was right there. Yeah. Uh. And that's why she would say it. I'm okay now. And I never cried after that. Something uh. she told me to don't cry. Yeah. And then Carolyn, the, young, the, other, the other daughter, she was a, uh, she went to school and took nursing after high school. And I helped her on that. Helped her with her room money for a car and bought her another, bought her a new Chevrolet Imperial, not Imperial, Impala. It was only a year old. I bought her that and gave her that. Took it down to Detroit for her. And she went to school and, and in nursing, she went farther. She became a head nurse in surgery at the hospital in Port Huron, Michigan. And she was busy, always busy. They had 13 acres they bought at this little town in middle Michigan. And uh, on there they put on, they had five horses, five dogs, and a bunch of barn cats she, she designed and had her own barn built there for all those animals, for the horses. The dogs, they had the dogs to place, and the, it was always one or two that slept in the house. <laughs> but she loved the animals. And this, that, I don't like to say too much but about it, but she was working at the hospital and uh, all this other work and come home and then she had to take the granddaughter for her horse trials at the other high school. And I called her on Sunday to see how she was. I didn't know that she was doing that. To... And she said, Dad, I'm so tired. I just can't keep going. I can't do that. And I'm glad she didn't win first place. She won second. I wouldn't be able to go back. But it wasn't Stephanie's fault. She was just retired out from all the other stuff too. Yeah. And I talked to her for a few minutes and she said, I, 
I just have to go lay down. I said, okay. One thing I should have told her what the doctor told me years before. If you're tired like that, don't go to sleep right away. Better go slow. And she went in the house. Steve said she came in. And she went in the, this little room they had. They used for a, a computer room and stuff like that to do. She went in there and, and Steve said I went in there to, to call her to go to bed, I guess, or something. And he said there she was also. She was gone. Mm. She died right there, 60 years old. Mm. Yeah, it was too bad. I wanted to go <clears throat> I was going to move down there and buy a place to spend the summers. And uh, I liked the area because a good friend of mine lived there in that, just the mobile home section. And anyway, Carolyn talked me out of it. I said, no, Dad, Mom won't come out to visit me if you come in. If you come back. So I didn't want to interfere, I stayed away. Yeah. Steve was mad, her husband was mad about that. He's a great guy. He's still living. And as much as he didn't like her, he still take her care of her. She just died two weeks ago. Yeah. And he still took care of her. He still made all of her arrangements for burial. I said, Steve, she's got she had money, a lot of money. She said, no. She spent the whole thing in the nursing homes and the hospitals mm -hmm. without insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But he was a, he's been a great guy. And uh, I talked to him about that here about a week ago there. But I believe uh, I pray every night. Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, a fanatic, you know. Christian fanatic, but I believe, and yeah. I always said, if you pray for something, if if it don't work, it don't cost you nothing. <laughs> and uh, about two weeks ago, when Steve called me and told me that that she was back in the hospital again, and. <clears throat> So that night I went to went to bed. I said a prayer for for her. I always said one for her and my sister, even though we didn't get along, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, if friend goes, God take her in her sleep. Don't let her suffer with pain. Steve called me the next morning. She's gone. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. So, a lot of story in my life. A lot of it went by. When my uncle in Nabmoy, where I was born, and I was about seven years old, he owned a fishery there. You know, on the big dock where the sailboats come in and load lumber out. They haul lumber out on sailboats. And he went down to get in his boat. I don't know if he was going fishing or what. And it was a built-in built -in motor in the engine, and it blew up, and he was in it. Mm. It left him crippled all his life, mm. but he still kept on working. Mm. But he died of cancer too, only 40 some years old. Mm. And we were so lucky. My dad was commercial fishing later on again after he lost, after he got hurt, that rupture at, at the, at the r railroad station. Yeah. Mm. And <clears throat> I want to make this story short there, but I was going to tell you about going down there, walking down to the dock where Uncle Arthur got hurt. And I said to my dad, what is that piled up on the beach down there? 
just down a little ways from the, from the dock. And he said, that, that's sturgeon. I said, sturgeon? What in the world do they do with, why'd they do that? He said, the Indians have been catching them in their pond nice. They think the sturgeon's killing the whitefish. And they're, and they're catching all them sturgeon and bringing them up there. Bringing them out there just to die, just to rot, and that. Some of the best fish meat you ever eat, the sturgeon. And I said to my dad, after I said to my dad, how long do you think those were? He said they're between 12 and 14 feet long. <laughs> So we went out with Uncle Arthur one time before my dad started back fishing again. Went out with him to lift pond nets. And pond nets or trap nets, I don't remember. But there was where the white fish would go in but couldn't get out. And what happened? A, a, a bunch of sturgeon found their way into there. And they got in there and we went to lift them. Holy mess! <laughs> You see them come, coming up and going back down. And not me, just the kids, you know. Yeah. Scared the hell out of me. Yeah, yeah. Uh. And my uncle said to my cousin, his son, Elbert, get the sledgehammer. And the little one comes up, hit him. Well, that was dangerous for him to do that even, you know. It was against the law, too. And sure enough, here come the little one, about 40 pounds. Wham! He hit him on the back of the head with that sledgehammer. And pulled him in. Uh -huh. He pulled him in. Had to hide him out, you know. Yeah. But some of them fish there, my dad said, was 10, 12 feet long. Wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. They had to drop the nets. They had to drop it down and let them out. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. But we had some wonderful surgeon fishing. And if I can tell you a quick one, when my dad was ice fishing in the winter time, ice fished with some nets in the, not in the deep water, in about 20, 30 feet of water for the Menominees or a herring along the shore, not far from the shore. And we went out there with a the car. We had about 10 or 12 inches of ice. And they were lifting pulling nets through from the hole from where they had set. My dad said, I think we've got a big trout hooked in there. He said, the other guy, run out and get the gaff hooks. He didn't go, so my dad did. And this other kid and I was standing there and they had lifting shanty, big lifting shanty, you know, just the hole there. And, <clears throat> and, uh, Pretty soon, SC kept pulling the net a little bit. Oh man, I seen that big head coming. Out that door I went. <laughs> and my dad got back with the app hooks and he hooked them and pulled them out on the ice. Six and a half feet long, 180 some pounds. <laughs> In winter time, where do you suppose I rode in that car going back? In the back seat. <laughs> the fish down like this. And me sitting in there with that fish, having them covered up. Yeah. And took them to Uncle Arthur's ice house, where they packed ice for the winter time, you know, for the, for the summertime. Uh -huh. Cut the ice out in the winter and packed it. Took it there and, and they dressed it all out. Everything my dad had, he always shared it with everybody. He had certain ones he could give to. Uncle Arthur got half of it. There. And we had that bad winter set in there. And the trains got stuck in town. Freight trains and one passenger train. They couldn't go. The roads are plugged. So some, a couple of them come over and want to know if we could, my mother and dad could feed uh, some of the train men. And she said, well, we don't have any meat. The roads are all closed. But if you can eat fish, she said, anything. So mom could make, made sturgeon stew, big pots. You know. 
there. <laughs> you know what, the engineer off this one train, he came back and he said, before the train got cleared out, he came back and he said to my mother and dad, if you ever got in them surgeon again, my wife and I is coming through here on vacation in the summertime. We're going to stop in. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, she mom could really cook that wild meat, you know. Yeah, yeah. she really knew how to make it. Uh, I, I've been able to make fish stew right here with some of the fish. The ones I like best to eat now is tilapia. I like them better than... Uh, All the fame, popular ones who had the uh, ocean fish and that, and uh, they were good fish. But the uh, tilapia is a lot easier for me to eat. They're swallow. Oh. I have trouble in my down in here. Okay. Yeah. Well, through the years, Ron. Did you ever keep in touch with anybody you served with? Did you guys ever have any sort of reunions or? Uh, uh, not really. I should have. I wish I. Sh I wish I had have because I had one good friend. Uh, <clears throat> he whipped my second cook <laughs> in Louisiana before I went overseas. And I didn't blame him. The guy was our second cook, cooking for us. And he's one press that insults, insults. So I all took him outside, beat that poor guy. He was a guy who was from Alabama. He thought he was tough. Al whipped him pretty good. And. Uh, Went overseas and, and I box a lot. And funny part of this, Al and I never box together, but we turn out the best friends. Oh. <laughs> uh. <clears throat> and when I shot that one big wild boar over there, they said he weighed over 500 pounds. Wow. There. And when we, uh, when they dressed them out, we didn't eat that meat. We give it to the other camp, one of the other camps, because we had the younger ones, smaller ones there. But anyway, I kept a, a jaw of that big boar, and I cut all that bone, trimmed all that jaw bone out, and from where the bone started back in the jaw, came out and then came up, was eight and a quarter inches long. <laughs> yeah. And... Al got his shipping orders before I did, and I was going to bring that home. I bring I brought a gazelle homes and that gazelle horns. And, yeah, and Al come to me and before he left camp that day, we were in the mountain shed. He said, "Ron, I'd give anything if I could buy that that that." Uh, Tusk from you. Uh -huh. I thought it was. Oh, I said, hell, you're Al. We're good friends. I should have kept his address. Uh. I had it all on a list after I got out of the service. But our divorce came through. Mm. She destroyed all that stuff. Oh. Mm. Yeah. Mm. She destroyed all that stuff. Mm. Yeah. Well, is there, as we kind of wind down this interview, is there any, any other stories you can think of that you wanted to talk about or anything that I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? And Kara, if she was listening and if she has anything that she could remember, or do you think we pretty much got your story pretty good? Uh, Kara, am I missing anything? I think you should tell a story when I was born. Pardon? When I was born. Tell the story when, when Kara was born. Oh, yeah, when she was born, yes. When I was living here, I came here to begin with out west for my health, you know. Yeah, uh -huh, right. But then they ended up meeting Ruth, and then we stayed here, there, and we worked it out. We'd, Ruth and I, had, I wanted to get married. That was the reason it didn't work out. So uh, 
my daughter passed away on October 14th, 1985. And Ruth and I went back there and we, when we came back and then uh, the next spring, uh, Denise was in the hospital. So we went up there and Ruth and I and Denise's husband, Tony, and we were up at the hospital. We stayed there all night and waiting for the, for Denise to have the baby. So she had the baby, I don't know, it was about one or two o'clock in the morning or something like that. And <clears throat> so we left there about seven o'clock, I guess it was in the morning coming home. And we we're coming down this road, and I remember, and I, I can remember coming down, and we seen the hospital was up on a high country, wasn't it? I can't remember the name of it. I seen we were coming down, and I said to Ruth, who's going to take care of the baby? And Denise goes back to work at the candy factory. She's going to be off two weeks. She said, I don't know. I said, why don't we? She said, do you think you'd like that? I said, yeah, I think that'd be fun. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it comes. Up. And then when we, had it, when we had her here, my daughter, the last one that passed away, she's the one that got carried a smile in the buggy right where that walker's sitting. Uh -huh. I remember that. She was real small yet. Mm -hmm. But she played and played with Kara, and she finally got Kara to smiling there. But that's the way it went all in all the mirrors ever since. And uh, you used to pull me in the box. And anyway, when she got old enough, I could get her out. I took the walker. I'm supposed to walk because I got her out here working again out here. I went back to work out here and I wasn't supposed to, but I did, and I liked it. I went back to work as an operator and ended up as a foreman operator <laughs> there. But I got hurt on uh, Labor Day 1985, and she was born on March 22nd, 26th, isn't it? 23rd, 1986. And, and <clears throat> so I would walk her around up and down when she started, <clears throat> started gaining. Then we got, we could go a little farther. Then we got to cover her up from the shade, you know, so she don't get the sun on her. Yeah. We got to where we walked so far, I, 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 I paced it with the car one day. I went what the way we had gone. We'd gone three miles <laughs> <laughs> of walking. <laughs> and that's how we're never, it's been that way ever since. Oh, uh, wow. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. And she's been like my own great granddaughter I got back there. Is all right I talk about the school? Oh, yeah. So I treated her just like she's my own. So when Kara wanted to go back to college to learn, my veteran's pension was coming through, 1500 a month. Come to 1550 now, here. So I split it. Half with Kara, and half with Stephanie. Kara finished her two years in college and Stephanie has been two years, but she missed it by three points. They had to compete out of like 300 people. They only picked out 70 some. And she was three points too low. Yeah. But she's still working. She still works in a nursing home there. So that's what I've done with the girls to help them go through school with that money. Uh -huh. Well, we spend quite a lot of it here at the house here. Yeah. It's like the bathroom upstairs. 
went to pieces, you know, and had to tear off the yeah. floor and everything, stuff like that. Windows, all of them. Well, you can start from the top of the house to the bottom of the basement. Everything. Huh. And that's where I spend my money. Yeah. Yeah. I was told by <clears throat> I was told by a fortune teller my sister sent me to one time in Detroit. He said, Ron, you'll always make a lot of money, but you'll never be rich. Exactly. Huh. I work construction, you know. Yeah, yeah. Made good money on that. All the pensions I've had. I don't have nothing left. Yeah. I give it all away. Yeah. Wow. But the best thing I've done is help them too through school. And Stephanie's still going. But I had another account in northern Michigan. Kara was there when when we arranged that that time. She went with me to Michigan. We put Stephanie on that savings account, which was only $101, $103 a month. Plus they get a, a bonus sometimes once a year from the union that went into that. And my other granddaughter, her mother, she had she worked and lives in Florida. <clears throat> Both knees are gone to pieces. She had to have operations. And I haven't called her yet, Kara. <laughs> <laughs> and she's had one of the operations now. That's the funny part was I was gonna call Stephanie. <clears throat> and ask her if she wanted to draw that money out of the savings account. And I was thinking about it, and she called me. And she wanted to know if she could draw some of that out to help her mother. I said, sure. It's in your name whenever you want it. But I had to okay it. Yeah. You know? Okay the address and that, everything where it goes to. So... I had to call. Uh, I had to call the bank and tell them. And she said, "How much do you want to give her?" And I told her, "I said, there's over ten in it. You want to give her the whole ten, ten thousand. So she, they sent her that. She sent her mo mother three thousand of it for the time being. She had the one operation now." And she had to wait, her mother has insurance, but she had to wait till a certain time. I wasn't supposed to be until October, but they found something that they could do it sooner. So she's had the one done. She got the other one to do. So that was, that's about the end of the money. Yeah. That I was passing out like that, you know. The rest of it, whatever comes in. Gives it out to the, this and that, whatever, or here at the house, right here at the house, you know. Yeah. Well, Ron, we'll, we'll wind down this interview. I want to thank you for telling your story today, but I also want to thank you for your service to our country. Oh, yeah, it was, it was good. I was, I thought we were going to Japan, but uh, I had friends that went there. Uh, Ruth's brother-in-law, Lawrence, him and I went to school together. That's where he went, and it was pretty rough. Yeah, yeah. Pretty rough. Wow. He said the one time he took a prisoner, a Japanese prisoner, come running out, nothing on, no gun or nothing, <clears throat> hollering he wanted to give up. Lawrence said, I didn't know they'd rather shoot him or not, because they had tricks where they'd use to put bombs in her body and then hmm. he took them in and said, no, it was okay. Hmm. But things like that scared him. Yeah. But he said some of the places they went had to go through some of them islands and that. Hmm. So I was lucky to go to Iran, really. Yeah. yeah. And actually, on your trip, you went completely around the world then. I went all the way around. Yeah. 
I've been a lot of countries. Yeah. A lot of countries. Went from the West Coast around. Yeah. Yeah. To uh, New Zealand. New Zealand. And then to Australia. Then to Bombay, India. And then from Bombay, India, and up into Iran. Across the river, right from us, was Iraq. <laughs> wow. And then from there, I actually crossed the Russian border once, and they didn't know it. And I didn't realize it at the time until it was too late. But we made our back all right. When we got there, we were looking for a Christmas tree <laughs> before I left Iran. And we come to this guard station. It's on the... Uh, road where the convoys come through, you know. Our trucks were all painted the same. They're all stained in Russian, Iranian, and American. There. And you see these two guards? So we have a fifth of, wit of vodka. We'll give it to them. We went up looking for that Christmas tree and couldn't find it. And hell, we gotta get out of here. We went back. And these guys didn't even see us go. <laughs> Uh, no. wow. <laughs> but he wouldn't want to go across the Russian border, really. They'd hold you. Yeah. Ooh. They wouldn't let you go, you know. They didn't trust anybody. Yeah. Hmm. But uh, the war in uh, Russia, when it come to a halt, we were only about how far? I figured. 450 miles from there. Wow. Yeah. What was that? The old, the old chancellor, the old Russian chancellor. Khrushchev. No, not Khrushchev. Brezhnev? Huh? Brezhnev or Stalin? Uh, Stalin, Joe Stalin. Yeah. Yeah, I got that picture. Kara's got it, I think, too. If you ever wanted one. I got the picture out of the Russian, out of the Iranian paper. Oh, when they met, had the conference there? I was there when they came. Is that right? Yeah. And I cut that picture out of the paper and kept it and brought it back here. I've made several prints of it. I think Kara's got a print there. Uh, that was Stalin, Joe Stalin, yeah. and Churchill and Roosevelt. Yeah. And funny part of it is we had... <clears throat> We had the old stand guard out along the road to come up to our camp from downtown. We didn't know why. We didn't know what was going on. But you got to get there. Stand guard. And then to come to find, find out later on. And I didn't know this, so I read the story back here. President Roosevelt was already in our camp. And it was just a make-believe thing. Huh. He was already in our camp staying. Wow. And they, they, the story said, <clears throat> if he would only knew where he was going when he got on that B-57, when he went flew from England to uh, Tehran, from the U.S. to Tehran, there, and he didn't know where he was going. Wow. And he was going to meet Churchill and uh, the Russian. Stalin. Yeah. Stalin. Uh, Stalin. Wow. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it was interesting. I, I think about it a lot of times, and I go back and think about the different things that happened, you know. And the one thing that got me is has gotten me sometimes that I was the one that, that taught them how to plow the road out uh -huh. and of course they couldn't do it. I got them to do that. That was one of the things. And then uh, how to get the fresh meat and bring it home uh -huh. <laughs> up in the mountains. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. When I got in the mountains, you know. And old Captain Colomar, when they sent him from Turan up to our camp, Later on, 
First time we had any fresh meat. Yeah. We had that wild boar. Yeah. The wild boar is just like eating beef. No fat. No fat. Uh, it was real good. Uh, Couldn't hardly tell the difference between them and beef. No. But it was against the... It was against the... The religious laws in Iran. They didn't eat beef. They didn't eat pork. Pork, that's right. Yeah. No. And we had hunting out at that one camp. We got stuck crossing an irrigation dish. 32 miles from the highway. And uh, <clears throat> uh, this it was a village right not far from us. About a thousand feet from us where it happened. And uh, we were chasing a bunch of wild boar. And they crossed that. We thought we could go across. I wasn't driving. I was on the back with the rifle. But we couldn't catch up to them. We hit that and went down too deep there. We became friends with the old chief of the village. He came out to see us, him and his two boys. And he talked in Iranian to us. We looked our book out and read it to him. And we ended up staying with him. Wow. In his, up in his pad at night. That, and those guys took turns at, at sleeping because we didn't trust them. Yeah. And we slept on them beautiful Persian rugs. Uh, uh, you couldn't bring them rugs out of the country. Yeah. They had a color you can't, couldn't take out. There. And we made good friends of his. So when we came back, pick him up. We started hunting gazelle at night time. We'd go pick him up. We'd hunt gazelle. Then in the morning, we'd after the little pigs. He knew where the pigs were hanging out. That's how we got so many pigs. And when we'd go by his place, we'd drop him off a gazelle. They could eat gazelle. Uh. Oh, and they were so happy about that. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Little. She's very, very nervous, and her sugar is going to be sky high. Uh, huh? Her sugar is going to be sky high because she's so nervous. Okay. Well, we'll, uh, we'll we'll close down this interview, Ron. Thank you for telling such a fascinating story. Oh, uh, yeah. Fascinating story. Thank you very much. Yeah, I could go on and on.